Welcome to tonight's event for the Belfast International Arts Festival. We are delighted you could join us. My name is Richard Wakeley and I am the festival's artistic director and chief executive. Tonight we're screening a recent conversation with two outstanding writers, Sebastian Barry and Sarah Moss, hosted by the Lyric Theatre's literary manager, Rebecca Mayers. Sebastian Barry is a festival favourite and we're delighted to welcome him back to speak about his latest novel, A Thousand Moons, which follows his best-selling Days Without End to pursue the story of Winona, the young Sue girl adopted by Thomas and John in the earlier novel. Her narrative of life in 19th century America is part love story, part family saga, part thriller, and part meditation on contemporary themes, including sexuality and gender identity. Sebastian is the current laureate for Irish fiction and is the only writer to win the Costa Book of the Year award twice. Sarah Moss is one of the most critically adored novelists across these islands. Her new novel, Summer Water, is set on the longest day of the year, where 12 people form a makeshift community in the Scottish Highlands and experience tensions, divisions and tragedy. It is a very modern but timeless story of the human capacity for love and cruelty. Sarah is a writer and academic whose seven novels have won unanimous acclaim and numerous awards. In 2020, she moved to Ireland, where she teaches creative writing at University College Dublin. Books by these two writers, including their latest collections, are available in person or online from No Alibis Bookshop in Botanic Avenue, Belfast. If you enjoy what you see this evening, please consider joining us again tomorrow for a tremendous final day of this year's festival, featuring a selection of outstanding authors and speakers, including Jenny Offal, Scholastic Mukasonga and Nina Barari. And at seven o'clock, a US presidential election special with Sarah Churchwell and Michelle Cressfield, hosted by our own Fintan O'Toole. For more information on all our events, please visit our website www.belfastinternationalartsfestival.com Thank you for watching and enjoy the screening. Well, hello, you're very welcome to the Belfast International Arts Festival and this discussion with Sarah Moss and Sebastian Barry about their new novels. Um, before we get started, um, I know you're probably very familiar with their work, but just to give them a brief introduction. Sarah Moss was born in Glasgow and grew up in the north of England. She's the author of seven novels and a memoir of her year living in Iceland, Names for the Sea, was shortlisted for the RSL on Dachi Prize. Her novels are Cold Enough, Night Waking, which won Fiction Uncovered Award, Bodies of Light, Signs for Lost Children, The Tidal Zone, all three of which were shortlisted for the Welcome Book Prize, and Ghost Wall, which was longlisted for the Women's Prize and shortlisted for the RSL on Dachi Prize. Summer Water is her seventh novel. Sebastian Barry is an Irish novelist, playwright and poet, and he is the current Irish laureate for fiction. His novels and plays have won, among other awards, the Kerry Group Irish Fiction Prize, the Costa Book of the Year Award, the Irish Book Awards Best Novel, the Independent Booksellers Prize, and the James Tate Black Memorial Prize. He also had two consecutive novels shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize. His current novel is A Thousand Moons, a follow-up to his acclaimed novel, Days Without End. So now that's over, um, my name's Rebecca Mayers. I'm literary manager at the Lyric in Belfast. Um, it would be great to start, if you both wouldn't mind, um, if we began with a reading of an extract of your books so that people right. can get a flavour of, of what we'll be talking about. Sarah, would you like to go first? Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm going to read from near the beginning of Summer Water and we're with a character called Justine, who is a middle-aged mother of two getting up very early in the morning to go running before family life starts. She left her kit ready in here last night. Yesterday's knickers, they'll be in the wash as soon as she's back. The moment of fear as she fights to get her elbows through her sports bra. One of these days, she thinks, one of these days a woman is going to die doing this, or at least dislocate her shoulder, and it'll be worse getting it off or wet. She probably doesn't need it anyway, the special tight bra. But they always say you must, however tiny your tips, or terrible things will happen. The thing about running in the rain is to wear as little as possible. Your skin's waterproof and it's layers of wet fabric that make you cold, not to mention the chafing. Capri leggings, she's not shaved her legs, no point in this weather. 
But any other loon out there in this rain will have better things to think about. Both hands to ease the door handle. Stop at the children's door to unravel two sets of breathing. Dither about whether to take the one key, leaving them locked in and needing to go through the windows in a fire. The windows being low and easy to open, and there being no plausible cause of fire just now. Or leave the key, meaning that she can't lock the door and there are three beloved souls sleeping undefended in the woods. Or at least two beloved souls and one mostly tolerated one. Fire, she thinks, is more likely than murderous nutters. You do hear of psychopaths hanging out in holiday parks, but only in America. And the good thing about being at the end of a 10 mile single track road is that the getaway options are crap. Unless, of course, the nutter plans to hide in the woods until dark. But there's not much dark this time of year. And wouldn't the police bring dogs? Or he could swim across the loch, at least if he thought to bring a wetsuit. Or she. Women can probably be serial killers too. Wasn't the one in Japan? Though that was life insurance fraud more than sadism. Not that it makes much difference to the victims. Though a fraudster probably kills you faster than a sadist, so maybe it does. You'd need to get into the wetsuit before embarking on your murderous games. Not something you want to be doing between committing a crime and leaving the scene. Even worse than putting on a sports bra. Jesus, look at that rain. There's almost no point putting clothes on for that. If she'd brought her swimming costume, she'd wear it. One thing, it can't keep up like that all day. There can't be that much water up there. She sits on the veranda to fasten her shoes, to adjust her armband and choose her music. She should probably run mindfully here, listening to the wind in the trees and the lapping of the water, and any birds deranged enough to attempt flight in the deluge. But fuck that, she needs music for her feet, music to connect her feet to the ground so she doesn't have to think about it. It's not, she sees, even half five yet. She can have two hours if she wants them, get in a quick 20k. Though if she does that, she'll be eating all day and the kids wanting a snack every time they see her. But she knows she's going to do it anyway. She's got four peanut protein bars tucked into her package of sanitary towels in the suitcase, the only place no one else is likely to look. And she's not too proud to eat them in the bathroom if she has to. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. Sebastian, do you have a piece to read? I, I'll just read from the first two pages of Thousand Moons. Uh, as a 65-year-old as a person reading a 17-year-old person, it's quite a challenge, but I will do it. Chapter one. I am Winona. In early times, I was Odijinka, which means rose. Thomas McNulty tried very hard to say this name, but he failed, and so he gave me my dead cousin's name because it was easier in his mouth. Winona means firstborn. I, I was not firstborn. My mother, my elder sister, my cousins, all, my aunts, all were killed. They were souls of the Lakota that used to live on those old plains. I wasn't too young to remember, maybe I was six or seven, but all the same, I didn't remember. I knew it happened because afterwards, the soldiers brought me into the fort and I was an orphan. A little girl can suffer many a sea change. By the time I got back to my people, I couldn't converse with them. I remember sitting in the teepee with the other women and not being able to answer them. By that time, I was all of 13 or so. After a few days, I found the words again. The women rushed forward and embraced me as though I had only just arrived to them that very moment. Only when I spoke our language could they really see me. Then Thomas McNulty came to get me again and took me back to Tennessee. Even when you come out of bloodshed and disaster, in the end you have got to learn to live. You have to look about you, see how things are, grow things or buy things as the case may be. The little town nearby us in Tennessee was called Paris. Lige Megan's farm was about seven miles out. It was quite a few years after the war, but the town was still full of rough Union soldiers kicking their heels, and the defeated butternut boys were a sort of secret presence, though they were not in their uniforms. Vagabonds on every little byway, and state militia watchful for those vagabonds. It was a town of many eyes watching you anyhow, an uneasy place. 
To present yourself in a dry goods store to buy items, you have got to have best English or something else happens. At the fort, Mrs. Neal had given me my first English words. In later times, John Cole got me two books of grammar. I looked at them long and good. It is bad enough being an Indian without talking like a raven. The white folks in Paris were not all good speakers themselves. Some were from other places, German, Swede. Some were Irish like Thomas McNaughty. They only got to English when they got to America. But myself being a young Indian woman, I guess I had to talk like an empress. Of course, I could have offered my list of items that Rosalie Bougereau, who worked on Lydas farm, had written out, but it was better to speak. Else what was happening was, I was going to be beaten up every time I was in town. It was English kept me from that. Some straggly farm hand might look at you and see the dark skin and the black hair and think that gave him a right to knock you down and kick you. No one saying boo to him for that. No sheriff or deputy neither. It wasn't a crime to beat an Indian, not at all. Thank you so much. Um, so I think we should start by addressing the elephant in the Zoom, um, and then we can move swiftly on. Um, how does it feel to release a new piece of work um, in the current circumstances? Does it feel any different in actuality? Um, well, I, uh, my, this book was published um, the end of March, mm -hmm. and I think almost the day it was published, all the bookshops in Ireland and the UK closed it. And uh, so that was a bit peculiar. But we were lucky in that we had done all our PR in the months leading up to the book. So there was that. And somehow we held on by our fingernails to the precipice through ebooks and, and the rest. Uh, but it was a very different experience and it was quite frustrating initially not to be able to go to do the things that sometimes I have actually dreaded doing, which is going to all the bookshops and doing the festivals. And in being prevented from doing it, I realized that at some level I actually relish it and I'm happy to gird my loins and go and do that. But so that wasn't going to happen. I think Sarah's book is a little later. Is your book out just recently, Sarah? Yes, mine came out at the end of August, um, August 20th. So it was a bit different, but also, you know, no, people have been very, very good at putting together online festivals and I'm deeply grateful for all of that work. Yeah. And I, as I teach online, I can imagine quite how much effort it is to take something like a festival online. Mm. Um, and I'm hugely appreciative of that because writers need it every bit as much as readers. At the same time, I terribly miss the real human interactions. I discovered my inner extrovert in lockdown um, and discovered quite how much I love an audience. I mean, I kind of knew that anyway, because I'm a university lecturer by profession and that's all about standing in front talking. Um, but I've, I've terribly missed those contacts um, and there's no substitute for them. The online stuff is amazing and it gets to lots of people and it's wonderful that we have it, but it's not the same thing as being in a room together. No, I miss the the terror of going to the place and imagining three people and trying to be mentioned enough to get over that and I'll do it anyway and you know as an old theatre person and then just standing in sort of secretly in your private self behind a screen maybe and then walking forward and hearing that beautiful noise that an audience makes just as a group of human creatures and then and then the heat that comes off a crowd of people, the benevolent heat. I miss all that. I didn't even know I missed it. But these are, these are why we, reasons we do these things. And all the festivals, it seems to me, have been very noble. And they don't mention the sense of bereavement I think you feel from the loss of those things because they're too noble and good. But I'm mentioning it because there is a sense that people have been almost ridiculously brave and, as you say, putting these festivals back into, at least into the ether. Yeah. I miss being able to make people laugh and that sense of the audience reaction and the yeah. yeah the way you can you can read a room and you can feel a mood and you can take it and make something of it I, you can't do that online and making yourself um, 
yourself discovering something as you read it, maybe for the first yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, that, that'll only happen just when the book is published. I've never read anything aloud. And then you go out and yes, you find it's funny in places. You have no idea having your children haven't told you endlessly how unfunny you are in every way. And then suddenly you think, oh, well, not completely, kids. There's this. And then maybe um, when you're a little bit moved and they're moved, that's something too. And then the, the line afterwards, the people who come up to talk to you say, isn't that wonderful? When, and yes. the things people say, and you're on your best behavior. You'll never be so good in that moment, like in the childish sense. And everyone is on best behavior. And say th they say, people say things to me that cause other books. You know, these are, it's important. Yeah. It's important because, I mean, they're telling us now that in, you know, 5.2 billion years, there won't be anything. There'll be no earth. That makes it even more important to help, to hear the, to have the heat from the audience. If we're only going to be around for another one or 100, 200,000 years, you know. Hmm. I'd be surprised if we're around in one or 200 years. That might be rate. ambitious. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Maybe 50 years. Uh, that, that's uh, so perceptive, like we, the idea that we kind of are missing even the things that we thought we dreaded. We actually just, we miss that. And also, yeah, 100% that idea of kind of communion, of congregating, of being in a room together and the invisible exchange of energy that happens within that. Um, but it just, yeah, I just wanted to start with that, just acknowledge kind of the circumstances in which we otherwise should probably be in a room together on the lyric stage, maybe discussing this, but here we are in Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, but I would love to kind of, kind of dive into discussing kind of the work, if I can, because mm. I suppose having read them both now, on the surface, your, your novels do seem very different in terms of setting and story and voice. But very quickly, I noticed common themes and echoes uh, emerging between them. Um, they're both set in, in volatile societies. Um, A Thousand Moons is set in post-Civil War Tennessee which um, was in itself kind of split along Union and Confederacy lines. Um, and Summer Water is set now in post-Brexit Scotland, which is similarly split. The Civil War England, you don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, you know, it, and in Scotland as well, it's split both in terms of mm -hmm. EU and independence. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, just the obvious question that, you know, so, you know, I wanted to ask, like, how far are you affected by um, or was your writing formed in response to the, the current political climate? Sarah, if you want to start, so that'd be great. Mm. Certainly mine was, and I think writing always is actually on some level, I mean, often on levels that are quite hard to find, but we, you know, we live when and where we live and that shapes everything about how we think and how we read and how we write. I didn't want to write a Brexit novel, um, but I don't think those anxieties about foreigners and outsiders and identity are limited to Brexit. I mean, in some ways it would be easier if they were, if Brexit was simply a local problem rather than a symptom of a much wider crisis, um, that would be less frightening. But in some ways, Summer Water is just a book about the stranger coming to town and how the town reacts. And towns react differently in different times and different places. So I guess that's where it's inflected by by the world around me, but I was certainly thinking about Englishness and Scottishness and being European and islands, but also about the real crisis, which has nothing to do with Brexit, it's climate change. And that's actually much bigger and more frightening than any of our, our political worries. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, if, I, if I can, maybe I'll come back to that point and kind of, um, Sebastian, maybe put that question to you about how far you were informed by current circumstances. Well, you know, we live, this is responding to Sarah in a way, but we live in, um, you know, deeply privileged society. A lot of our ideas of normality are actually exceptionally privileged ideas. Um, the natural state, I mean, the, the problem of the world vis-a-vis -vis borders is the fact that we created them. The natural condition of hu the human creature is, is moving on, moving on to a new place. And actually it defines to a certain degree all of the history of America, for instance, but, but all other history too. If you consider the three or five women in Africa who, has, who are our original great mothers, um, we're all the, the descendants of those people and all modern humans 
as Mr. Dillinger says in On Cain and Side, one of my books, he says, the good news is we're all the same family. And the bad news is we're all the same family because families are such trouble. And this effort to stand on borders and say, oh, no, not you. Oh, no, you're not like us. Or you're going to destroy what we are is so nonsensical at the DNA level mm. that it's worth that it's worth repeating. I mean, if you accept that we're all the same, all modern humans on the earth come from the same origin, then, then nothing makes sense. The problems in the north of Ireland, uh, the problems in the Middle East, it's all, it's all a thing we've made up for ourselves to torture and other other people. You know, there is no they in human discourse. There's only we. And we are currently up against it even here and in other parts of the world they can tell you much more clearly what it's like to suffer climate change the world the the, the planet has not always been friendly towards the human creature and we're in a very strange place of nearly se eight seven or eight billion people uh, which we've never been before and uh, these are all the problems in the sense that we've we both create for ourselves and discovered as the great monsters waiting for our, to be the consequence of our decisions and the way we live. Um, for me, it was somebody like Winona, who is a native person. And, and the point is we, we were all once native people, you know, especially in Ireland, it's very clear. But a native person is probably the most important um, demonstration, the most important angel you can look at in human terms because, because they, 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 they are primarily experiencing the atrocity of, of European thinking in a way. So that's where, that's where I am with that. But I mean, it's, as Sarah says, you live in your own time of place and, and that affects you without having to really concoct a, a politics. I wouldn't say I was a political person. But just to pick up there on something, uh... Uh, Sarah uh, kind of mentioned from the get-go and, and Sebastian you picked up on this idea of kind of climate crisis which is kind of being the the, the fundamental kind of urgency behind them and um, I think in, in both of your pieces of work the the landscape is presented as slightly sinister or hostile and um, it's very much like a living breathing thing it's a character in its own right um, and Sarah you have these little beautiful vignettes um, interspersed in between the um, the, the streams of consciousness, the, the interior monologues, that kind of really kind of bring that to the fore. Um, but it's a view of nature that is robust, it's assertive, um, it's unbeaten down by humanity. Um, and yet, as you referred to in Summer Water, the climate crisis is very much um, uppermost in the minds of some of the characters, in particular, the, the younger kind of teenage kind of characters. Um, I think this is, is a really interesting contrast. Um, so despite the characters' concerns, there's a sort of a sense of uh, humans are the ones on the losing team. So I'd love to kind of delve into that a bit more because nature is so prevalent in both of your, your, your writing, but yet it's a very, it's a very kind of hard nature. It's not something that's it's kind of fighting back, I suppose. I wanted there to be a sense of nature, nature out of time. And I was thinking about some of the Shakespearean plays where somebody will just casually mention that the harvest has failed three times in a row and the moon's in the wrong place or something. Just that sense of things being out of kilter and not running properly, which I think we all have at the moment, you know, as we observe the weather. We've just had a few days of completely unseasonal sunshine and warmth here which is great and we all like it but we all also know perfectly well what's going on there and I was I mean I've been joking that I used to swim in the Irish Sea as a teenager but it, it is climate change hasn't warmed it up enough since then but it's always there and we don't actually do very much about it but we know about it I think I mean I've said before that I don't think it's the work of fiction to halt or prevent climate change I'm not interested in writing as a form of activism but one can't but note it I mean that's all I'm doing I'm not this isn't a book of climate change activism but it's a book that can see that the climate has gone wrong and that we all know that and none of us are doing anything about it because the scale of the thing is too huge for individual action um, and that wasn't a decision I made it's just how how it is I mean if you set a book here and now that is the case 
So it wasn't that I thought, now I'm going to write a novel in which there's climate change. I'm just writing a novel set in the first quarter of the 21st century. And Sebastian, is that something that you have a consideration of in your, in your, in your work? Because especially um, with this novel and its predecessor, which it's kind of a semi-sequel to, this mm -hmm. idea of like the, the natural world being kind of untamed and incredibly dangerous. Well, one of the, one of the um, well, the adventure of writing Days Without End was going out somewhere with the characters where, you know, there's no littles or uh, if you don't find your food, you're just going to die. And there's big weather all the time that's either going to freeze you to death or burn you to death. Uh, you know, I, as I say, our idea of the world being uh, our possession or turns a gentle eye on us, to my mind, is not really very accurate. Um, and as you say, Rebecca, you know, the world is infinitely self-renewing. If you consider the first extinction a few million years ago, when 90% of the life forms disappeared and then consider what was put in its place. There is an argument to say that um, it, while we are causing this extinction and maybe our own extinction, uh, something will replace it. And therefore, if you're disinterested, as Matthew Arnold um, recommended us all to be about everything, uh, you could just gaze upon it and say, well, it'll be a very painful moment for us all at some point. But nevertheless, the earth itself is secure in her, in her doings. Um, I mean, that's slightly Marcus Aurelian way of looking at it. But again, in writing about Winona, then in, this, in A Thousand Moons, she's a person uh, who has lost everything already. All the things she knew and all the places she knew have been removed from her. And the European soldiers, if I can call them that, the American soldiers, inverted commas, have, have done that. Uh, so she's already in, in a position of after loss. And that's why she's saying, even when you've been through this, you have to learn to live. Uh, so and I think in that example of somebody like her are ways to live. And that's all a novelist is ever writing about, you know, whether you're, whether you're Trollope or Hulbeck or whoever, is, it's really about how we live. And, and uh, many, many movements of literature have noted the futility of living and has made beautiful works of art even out of that. Um, we are trying to call things that are inimical to us by friendly names. You know, and it, it's a losing game. I say it's beautiful weather here. And Sarah points out, well, that's probably not a great sign. You know, so we have that. But it is, it, as long as we can live and breathe, it is all a wonderful moment to be a novelist, isn't it, Sarah? Because uh, the, the, the whole sense of doom, and of course, coronavirus is linked into this great loss of species and great loss of habitat. Um, I mean, we can only sing as, as obedient citizens, not of a country, but of a planet. We can only sing all the brighter in the midst of this. That's all we can do. That's great. I think um, it's very beautiful. Um, if we can go back to what we were saying, maybe pick up the thread about um, you know, Sarah's idea about that you know, a stranger walks into town and experiences hostility. Um, I mean, that's definitely there in Summer Water um, with the xenophobic, if not racist, sort of thoughts directed towards the Ukrainian family um, who are on the campsite, um, who are often correctly labelled as Romanian and Bulgarian, and I think Polish, you know, during the course of different people's perspectives. Um, and arguably, and you can argue this, it's probably more prevalent in the attitude towards the English on the site in terms of this kind of Brexit betrayal. Um, and it's very, very clearly there also in A Thousand Moons. Um, ironically in the treatment of uh, Winona, who is, who is native, who is not an immigrant, who is not a newcomer, who's been there the entire time. Um, 
Well, I think fundamentally, you know, and let's talk about this, but I think the, the sense that I got from both pieces was that they're ultimately hopeful because they deal with the reality of, of us having to come together in makeshift families and communities and the challenges and joys of how we actually exist together. Um, so in a way I was kind of, yeah, I wanted to ask, are you ultimately hopeful? I find myself increasingly suspicious of the of talk about hope um, and I'm not sure it's a helpful idea in as much as it's a gesture towards a kind of happy ending or happily ever after um, which you don't find in real life I mean that's something fiction can give you sometimes but I don't think that that's one of the differences between fiction and, and life um, so I think I wouldn't say I'm hopeful. It's a moment where I find myself quoting John Updike, who is somebody about whom I feel enormous ambivalence because I think he does beautiful sentences and horrible gender politics. Um, he says optimism is not a philosophical position, it's an animal necessity. And I think that's right. I think in the face of all of the very strong evidence for pessimism and hopelessness, that's not actually functional. One can't live like that. And I think, you know, come the final moment, I'm a pragmatist. So you have to proceed as if there's reason for hope, even when you know that there isn't. I, I, I you know, a sense of hope is, uh, is properly momentary, from moment to moment. You don't have to be blindingly hopeful the whole time. And, but what I have found in my own life, being mildly, having suffered mildly from depression and the opposite of hopefulness um what injects me with something i even call it hope if you like but um and hope maybe is as close to human joy as we need to come is just the the, the verifiable moment when your friend turns that friendly face to you and and says something to you that recompenses you for any more brutal things you, you've experienced in your life or, and the fact that people have the impulse to do that, to assuage and to, to, to nurse you, you know, to parent you or befriend you, to be, be befriended seems to me one of the great magnificences of this proper, probably wretched creature that we are, let's be clear. But you know, if we weren't, as wretched as we are, really, if you look at us just with eyes wide open, mercilessly, you could say, we, there'd be nothing to write about or paint or, or put on in the theater. We would be entirely without interest. And it's this reek of ambiguity in the, in the human creature that makes it so marvelous, so radiant when someone just dances on a pin of self and gives you something. That makes me hopeful. It doesn't make me think, oh, we're all going to be all right and everything will remain the same. Because actually I wouldn't fancy that either. But um, it does make me think that it's worth the candle for the moment. And every novel in my experience of reading novels is saying, well, the night, you know, there's a dark night and, but it's, you know, how we live, what it gives us is worth that candle that you burned uh, to get through the darkness. It's not hopeless because nothing is more embittering. And the primary duty for me of the writer is not to be bitter in any way or disappointed. And, but that's, the converse of that is not hopefulness. It's maybe gratitude. You could say, Rebecca, are you grateful for what you've experienced in your life? And you're saying that to, everyone has had these you know, terrible experiences. And, but are you grateful? And if you can still say, great, yes, I am grateful, then you are. You're, you, that's, oh, that's your wealth. That's your that's your proper bank. You know, that's, that's the real currency of the self. 
Mm. I would think about noticing more than gratitude, I think. I mean, I, I absolutely recognise that moment where you said one writes out, out of or into ambiguity, is that what you said? Mm. And I was thinking that's exactly what I mean by this pull between the evidence before our eyes and the animal need for optimism, because that's how you keep moving forward. Mm. And I'm always interested in writing into these moments of complete ambiguity and ambivalence. I sometimes say to students, you need to fence yourself in to the point where you're moving between two incompatible truths. And then the art of writing is right at the last minute, you do a little feint and get round between your two impossible truths and then you can write. I wouldn't think of what we find as gratitude so much as attention. Um, and that for me, writing is about paying very close attention more than feeling grateful. Mm. 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 So interesting. And I kind of, it, it comes back full circle to, I think, the very first comment about this idea of putting up borders and demarcating territory and, uh, you know, marking out otherness as being something really, well, nonsensical, considering where we all come from, but also quite primal. But then this idea of connection and um, hope and, and, and the, the, the desire to connect with other people they're kind of twins and they're and they're both sides of the same thing and I think they kind of go hand in hand that because we have this impulse to create fences and borders and boundaries then we also have the need to connect and vice versa because we have the need to connect and reach out we also sometimes need to protect ourselves mm. um, emotionally so they kind of go kind of hand in hand and it's a kind of this constant oscillation between the two of them but I think it's really interesting the comment about attention about, about um the, the the writer being there to note things yeah um uh, just leading on from that you both seem to have um right with like such profound empathy um it's, you know in summer water in particular you're you're occupying the minds of, of multiple characters often with radically different perspectives and perhaps different points of view um than your own um just to both of you is this idea of is this idea really important to you as you write um, to have that sense of empathy and connection with your characters? I'm not talking about likability. I suppose um, I'm asking about how you inhabit the world and, and viewpoint of another and then present that to us in a way that we can engage with it on its own terms without um, bias, I suppose. I think if fiction has a moral purpose, and I don't think fiction has to have a moral purpose, it can simply have an aesthetic purpose, but if we want a moral purpose for it, it's the ability to imagine other worlds through others' eyes and understand other realities. So yes, for me, that kind of shape-shifting is fundamental to the work of writing. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm, I'm thinking... Um... You know, the, you can, it's funny how one feels able to talk about writing when one isn't doing it. Because when, when it's almost a betrayal of the confusion you feel when you're working and the, the possession, sense of possession and uh, or the, the possession you long, I mean, you, you long to be replaced by your characters as it were, as you're writing them. So you're not getting in the way. Um, but it, it's not, I mean, it, I'm just thinking, trying to think of writing a novel, it, it's that moment when the Titanic is going down and you've been, you've been let down into the lifeboat and you're, you're not going to be immediately complaining about the other people who've been rescued. And you might be looking around with horror at people who haven't been rescued, but the sense of emergency when you're making a book, uh, does throw a lot of babies are thrown out with the bathwater of that moment, as it were, you know, you, you're not in your, you're not in full, you're not fully yourself. And, and, and I'm just intrigued that we, we imagine we can describe that state of being. So people sometimes say, why did you write such a book? Or, well, because there was no other lifeboat. You know, I couldn't get into any other boat and they wouldn't let me in anyway. And this is the one I'm in. And the sense of exigency of, of being pared down to just you breathing in and out with the goddamn ship sinking and uh, 
that's how it is right, for me writing a book. You know, there's no safety. And as we know, I mean, Sarah's talking about a moral element in a quite a different way to say the Victorian idea of a moral novel. And there were many of them and, have, and, and, and all of them have died terrible deaths in history. Um, but I mean, maybe sometimes, you know, when the soldiers were in the, in the trenches in the First World War, everyone would be pissing their pants. But, and everyone was terrified, but you didn't show it because you didn't want to spook the man beside you, you know, when you were going to go up the ladders. So maybe in, a, in an emergency, ship sinking, battle scenes, I don't know why I'm even using these metaphors. Uh, it can bring out a kind of essential salv salvageable quality in you. And I think the reason the writer tends towards deep empathy for all her characters is, or their characters or his characters is because you know that's your only ticket to dry land. By the measure of your empathy, that is how, how clearly your ticket for life is franked. And uh, somebody like Donald Trump, who seems to lack empathy for me, that stamp on his ticket is the faintest thing, you know. Whereas if you have, you know, Sister Stan, whoever in Dublin who works with homeless people. And when I say homeless people, I'm actually also talking about mag uh, magnificence unseen. Because I did a book club with homeless people. They turned out to be gods and emperors and empresses. Um, you know, somebody who actually works out of their empathy so blatantly. I mean, we might be in the halfpenny place of empathizers, but we might be equipped because of that even, because of the paucity of our empathy to describe empathy, because we know it's the only way we're getting out of here. <laughs> uh, and our novels in some way, well, I'm speaking for myself, are, are kind of pleas, you know, before the non-existent almighty to, um, be sort of let off the hook. And by showing, you know, like the child does, trying to show the best of themselves when a danger is coming towards them. I think it's small like that, or if that is small. You know, there's, I, Sarah, have you ever noticed any grandeur in yourself vis-a-vis -vis writing? I haven't seen any grandeur in myself. No. <laughs> and yet they give people knighthoods and damehoods and writers are revered, we have to ask, I mean, nobody's in this secret moment, you know, we have to wonder why. In some ways, would you accept that, no, I, if this couldn't be true for you, but, you know, to be the least of citizens is a necessity for a writer. Oh, yes. Yes, I would hey. say that. Yeah. Can't say I've been overburdened with reverence either, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you have, and I mean, just reading about you recently. It's incredible how people con construct an idea of you, which, which is kind of wonderful because that's, that's the dream. But in another way, there is, um, there's a dangerous terrain in it as well because you're walking through the forest with all the creatures around you as not quite yourself. They're giving you, a, as it were, a different scent you know, so that you're in more danger. But slightly altering the nature. It's very important for the writer, do you, would you agree to return to a proper sense of themselves? Oh, and yes. Your question, is that why, to some degree, you've, you've left the UK? Are you looking for a Sarah? I don't think no. so. I mean, I've always worked full time and like you had a family and been very involved in family life. And I've sometimes had moments when I come back from a festival where I've felt important and people have been listening to me and you know, there's been lovely scented stuff in the hotel room and I walk through the front door and someone says mum why hasn't my football kit been washed and there isn't anything from my sandwiches tomorrow and there's a bit of me that thinks do you know who I am but also that's real life I mean that actually that's who I am I'm the person who didn't wash the football kit and doesn't have stuff for the sandwiches tomorrow and it's my job to make sure that there is football kits and I, I mean that that sounds gendered but what I mean is that 
all of us have fundamental obligations to the practice of daily life, which is actually where real experience lies. And that's why I'm interested in writing about daily life. And that's why I'm interested in a poetics of washing up and cleaning the bathroom and finding the shoes. Because that's, that's actually also where we enact love. I mean, you can say you love somebody or you like. You love them when you get up and clean up their sick in the middle of the night. Um, you love them when the weather is terrible and you go out to get onions because they're in the middle of cooking and they've run out. Mm. It's, the, it's in those acts of daily life, of daily being with other people, that we are who we really are, much more than we are if we happen our to be on the stage. Ones, right? Yeah. I mean, it, if you ask me what's the most, you know, and a most important thing that's ever happened to me, it just couldn't be, although it was great fun to win the Costa Book of the Year twice. But I would think more of that moment in the summer dark of North Great Georgia Street in Dublin, when, when Carl, my daughter, was maybe a year, a year and a half, and her twin, Marilyn, in the cart as well. And lifting her out in this beating heat, and because she wasn't well, and she just vomited into my face, and it went all around me like a cloak, like a dress. And the two of us went into the loo and stepped into the shower, and showered off, sort of laughing. And my wife said to me, she said, "You must be a good father because you, you didn't get cross." Now that moment. Uh, this is that what this I treasure above all other things. It's things like that, like that. And if we have ten of those, Sarah, we are giants. Yeah, and any almost everybody does actually. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's why the that queue in a festival is so wonderful when people demonstrate their essential grace to you. I mean, there's so much to unpick there. I mean, that was that was so wonderful. I mean, like where to start, where to begin? I think to go back, I think this idea of writing be, being a creative emergency is is really interesting. Is that something you can connect with, Sarah? It's it, interesting because I hadn't, I wouldn't have thought of it in terms of emergency, but I also think the switch between the practice of writing and the emergence onto the stage with the book is is absolute mm -hmm. and because I was a professional literary critic a professor of English literature before and as I started publishing fiction I, I learned very particular ways of talking about books and literature which remain very useful to me but it they're not at all how I think when I'm writing that's not about the practice for me that's about the return as a reader and I'm often very glad of that strange gap in the writer's life where you've finished your book and it goes off into other hands for a few months before it comes back to you bound and printed and as a thing that you're going to take out into the world because in those months my relationship with the book changes and I can return to it as a reader rather than as a writer mm. and talk about it in the way that I might talk about a book that I'm teaching or a book that I'm reviewing but as the years go by, I'm increasingly careful to bear some kind of witness to the difference between those two processes, that the way you think about writing a book when you're writing it is absolutely not the way you think about reading a book, even if you've written it yourself and you're reading it to other people. For me, there's a very fundamental shift in my relationship with the book that happens between finishing writing it and taking it out into the world. But I also think, Sarah, that's quite a challenging shift. I mean, a, a person could go mad in the, the switch between those two things, that interior being that is actually sinking into some other synaptic sea in their brain to make this thing. And indeed, when a child runs into your workroom and says something, that's the only time you will ever scream out at your child, leave, I'm in the 1860s, don't drag me back. You know, and then this other person who gets on the airplane and, you know, is, and frankly, I, I have the most delightful publishers and Angus Cargill favors my editor and his partner or his wife, um, 
Kate is his is my publicist and it's all been like that for 15 16 years for eternity and I adore all that but I do recognize the that the leaping of it's more like a ditch you have to leap without falling down into the mud to get back from the writer and the because I do think the, the you know there's a psychiatric element to all of these things and we couldn't ask it you know with some interest what in the name of God are we doing what do we do what is this thing that we easily call writing and professor of English but what's that and can I ask you do you mind Rebecca if I ask since you are who are your mothers and fathers of of your writing I mean let's say that they're they're probably all dead but I mean Trollope and Conrad and Elliot would I mean George Elliot would be the ones for me who are your secret family that you concocted for yourself when you when you were a young writer maybe I think I'm deeply formed by the 18th and 19th century, which was both the, the well, they were both the books that were around me as a child. Um, I mean, I came from a fairly academic household, but not a household of readers. And what happened to be in the house was those wonderful 20th century Penguin Classics editions of Eliot, Bronte, Dickens. So, as I came up out of children's literature in the days before there was young adult, that was what I moved into because that was what was there. And then as an academic, my specialism was romanticism in the 19th century. So that was, that was kind of where I lived. I think I always go back to Dorothy Wordsworth because she is deeply committed to the practice of art and poetry as part of the art of daily life. She will be making an, apple pie, <clears throat> making an apple pie and helping William to edit a bit of the prelude or dragging William out of composing a poem and sending him, there's a lovely bit where she tells him to go dig a path through the snow to the necessary. I and he's just going to have to stop writing and dig that path because she needs to get to the loo, which is at the bottom of the garden and she can't do it. So, you know, bad luck, biological need takes priority. But she's so deeply committed to a good practice of everyday life as part of a good practice of poetry. So she's someone who's always with me. Um, there's an American 19th century writer called Sarah Orne Jewett, who is in quite a classically romantic idea of landscape, but she's interested in people in solitude. She doesn't write very much about families. She writes about people who are on the edge of family or alone or making different kinds of connections with each other and with the world. And I'm, I'm very fond of her. I think she writes very well. What's her second name? Orne Jewett, um, O-R-N-E-J-E-W-E-T-T. -E -E the country of the pointed furs. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was, um, years ago, my father would give me, when I was at Trinity College, my father would give me 10 pounds a week for pocket money. So I'd always go to Green's Bookshop, which no longer exists, and buy books. And at one point I bought, a set of books that no one was paying any heed to, certainly not at Trinity College. And it was the collected poems of Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Mm. And in that was Aurora Lee, which is um, a novel length poem, I suppose, or a novel in verse. Um, it is astonishing and delightful to me that in the intervening 40 years, so that is a, that is the raising back up of putting people in, in their proper positions. If you can raise writers, that's, that's one of the things you can do. You can reinstate them somehow. You know, if we all, in a sense, are prisoners or we all belong in the same, at least put them in, you know, their proper place. And that's been, that's, and my son Toby at, at Maynooth University, his whole segment of literature was on the women writers in America in the 19th century. I mean, this is, this is a huge sea change. We all knew that George Eliot was the greatest novelist that ever lived, but then they would go on quickly to talk about other people, you know. It, it, it's incredible change, you know. Um, I think we're approaching time. Um, I wanna thank you so much for um, being so generous with your time and your insights and your, and your comments about your books, yourselves, your writing, um, and the discussion between you is absolutely brilliant um, and so fascinating. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, quick plug for your various books. Um, 
Sarah Moss's Summer Water is um, available to buy signed copies from the, um, the Festival Bookshop and also Sebastian Barry's A Thousand Moons is also available from the Festival Bookshop um, and, and please do buy them, they're extraordinary pieces of work and I, I thoroughly enjoyed reading them so thank you very much both. It was lovely thank to you. meet you both.